Thank you, Miss Lizzie. Beautiful song. On that day, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day, and we're thankful for that. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, please, and turn to the book of, of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we'll be reading there in just a while. And I want to remind you of our theme verse this year, taken from Colossians chapter 2. And uh, we actually start with verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught. And our theme and our idea this year is just to get established in the faith and do so as quick as we can. Many of you are participating in the uh, discipleship program, some of you in one-on-one, -on -one, that's exciting. Uh, and then also on Wednesday nights, and we work through, I think, uh, verse or chapter 3. And I hope you'll be faithful every Wednesday night. It just goes for just about 14 weeks. Now, this Wednesday night, take just a little break. Uh, Pastor Paul Kingsbury will be preaching for us this Wednesday night, Lord willing. And uh, he has a special reason to come this way because he has two daughters down here. And grandbabies galore, uh, uh, the Russells and uh, Brandon and Jody had their little one. And then also uh, uh, Matt and uh, Julie Hayes getting ready to have their baby any day now. And so uh, he'll be down to see the grandbaby, so I want, you to I want you to hear him preach. And he is the founder and director of Reformers Unanimous, uh, Rockford, Illinois. He is a dear, dear friend. He'll be preaching this Wednesday night. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's stand together, please, read him God's Word, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to dive right into it. I'm actually using this verse as a springboard verse to get us over into our thought today. We're actually going to be in Psalm chapter 19 here in just a while. But I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I want you to read with me verse 3 together. Let me read it first, and then you can read it with me together. Verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Well, what a statement. I want you to read that with me, verse 3 together. Ready? But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now I want you to turn back while you're standing there to Psalm 19. Uh, Psalm 19, you're going to find a very, very powerful psalm. In fact, we addressed this somewhat uh, just the other night. In Wednesday nights, we talked about uh, the revelation of Scripture. And uh, we want to read down through verse 14 of chapter 19. And I'm reading this together, Psalm 19, because I want you to see how this psalm is put together. The first section is a doctrinal treatise uh, on how we understand who God is through creation. What is called... Uh, uh, the uh, general revelation of God. And then the second section of the psalm talks about special revelation. In other words, how we find out who the Creator was through the Word of God. And we just taught on this this past Wednesday night. I'm not doing this for this reason, but I, I like the way that today's message is going to build upon what we learned on Wednesday night. But the reason I'm reading this is because the last section, the psalmist goes to prayer. And he prays about sin and how he can be kept from sin. And I want to read through this psalm. Look at verse number 1, uh, verse 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, his circuit and the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof, speaking of the sun. The law of the Lord, now it changes gears in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, Excuse, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than my, uh, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. All that speaking of the word of God. He changes gears in verse 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me, he's praying now, from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength 
and my Redeemer. So the psalm is set apart like this. It speaks about creation. Then it speaks about the Word of God. Then it speaks about how these can keep us from sinning. I want to speak on this subject for just a while, taking my thought from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, how we can be established in holy living. The Bible says there in, uh, in that verse, in verse 3 of Thessalonians, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Establish you and keep you from evil. How does God do that? We're all sinful creatures. How does God help us not to sin? Now, nobody in this room is going to be sinless, sinlessly perfect. Only Jesus Christ was sinlessly perfect. Somebody say amen right there. But all of us has got to find a way to win over sin. And the truth of it is, you do not have that ability inside of you. You cannot just get down and say, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, because we're sinful creatures. Somewhere along the line, we've got to have some help. And I'm going to show you uh, three ways God helps us in that, and how God can establish us in holy living. And just so, in case you're wondering, if you're back there saying, I just don't know how you can win over this thing. I mean, there's just some things that got their lock on me. I can't win over them. I want to tell you today, you can win. And I'm not going to give you all of it because we don't have time today, but I'm going to give you at least some ways he shows us here in Psalm 9. Let's pray together. Father, please help us in this great truth today. Nobody is ever going to be perfect, but we've got to find the help somewhere. May we see today that you're the one that helps us. Teach us from that word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The Bible says in the Psalms, who can, who can understand his errors? <laughs> the errors of his way. How are we going to dig out of this thing called sin? Years ago, I heard a Christian uh, uh, comedian. He, he was actually, uh, he did other people's voices. What do you call that? You imitate people's voices. They call it something. And he, he could do it. Impersonate, impressions. There you go. And... Uh, he was good at it. He was hilarious. I can't think of the guy's name. And by the way, don't shout out at me. Let me preach this through, okay? But uh, he was sitting there, and he said, growing up as a little boy, he said, I used to sit back there and hear the preacher. And he said, I, and he said, I was just kind of an innocent little fellow. But he said, the preacher got up, and he said, and he turned his voice into the voice of Billy Graham. He said, what shall we do with sin? And uh, <laughs> he said, back here, little fellow, you know, he thought, well, that's a good question. I wonder what can we do with sin? He said again, he said, what shall we do with sin? Sin. He said that two or three times. That little boy said, man, somebody need to help the guy out. <laughs> he keeps asking the same question. What are we going to do with sin? What are we going to do with sin? So he said about the fourth time, he just jumps up in the voice of, of uh, Barney Fife. He said, nip it in the bud. He said, nip it in the bud. Nip it, nip it, nip it. Now, it sounds real easy, you know. <laughs> My dad, before you ever heard Barney Fife, he said, you need to nip that in the bud. I don't know if you ever heard Barney say that. But that means just shut it down, stop it. That would be nice if we could do that. But the truth of it is, I ask you the question, hey, what are we going to do about adultery? What are we going to do about fornication? And what are we going to do about stealing and murder and, and uh, uh, drug addiction and lying and drinking and gluttony and gossip and slander? And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Pride and arrogance and all that. What are we going to do with sin? By the way, we like to name the big sins about how bad they are. What are we going to do about gossip? And what are we going to do about slander? What are we going to do about those things? They're all sin. We're sitting here today. We're all in the same boat. We've got to ask ourselves the question, how can we win over that? And by the way, I can give you a lot of things. Uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and constrains us and all of that. But I want to help answer. I want to give you a doctrinal answer today really from the Psalms, and I want to show you some ways I think the Lord helps keep us from evil. See, the Bible indicates in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, this God that establishes us in this matter of avoiding evil. And I'm going to give you three things today. I want you to look in your Bibles in the Psalms there. Uh, I think he gives us three ways that we can keep ourselves, or he helps keep us from sin. Now, by the way, these are kind of like roadblocks. And you understand you can go around any roadblock. You don't have to obey the signs in life. You can go around every one of these. I'm going to give you illustrations of men in the Bible that did. But God works really, really hard at helping us in this matter of sin. Why don't you write this first one down, and that is number one, the works of God's creation. Would you write that down? The works of God's creation. 
And what I mean by that is in verses 1 through 6, <coughs> he talks about how God is our creator. And I want to keep in mind contextually in verses 11 to 14, he's talking about sin and he's, his plea to God is, Lord, keep me from presumptuous sins. Lord, how can I know the error of my way? And what am I going to, he's really saying the question, what am I going to do with sin? And he's begging God to help us in this matter of sin. How am I going to keep from committing some of these sins? And the first thing he says as he's meditating on this, he says, first of all, he says, I think about God as my creator. And can I say this, that if we're thinking, human beings, every time that we're faced with sin, we would be wise to be reminded that someday we will see our creator face to face. You understand that? Ms. Claiborne was just singing about that just a moment ago, that someday we'll be in his presence. Now, you need to understand either by death or the rapture, someday you will see your Creator face to face. And the Bible defines who He is in verses 1 through 6. He is a powerful Creator. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, the day and the night. He made those. The display of His creation, the Bible says here, is a 24-hour reminder that there is a God in heaven that hates sin. There's not a place, the Bible says here on earth, that it, God's creation is not declared. It says, day unto day, uh, utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. What does that mean? That means, as we taught you the other night on Wednesday night, that means that everywhere there's a day on planet earth and everywhere there's a night, it utters a speech that there is a God in heaven. There's not a language. I'm, there's not a language, a human language, anywhere on planet earth that does not get a witness that there is a day and there is a night. Where did that come from? Genesis chapter 1 told us the evening and morning was the first day, evening and morning was the second day. Six literal 24-hour days are defined in Genesis chapter 1. So the Bible says that anywhere you see the sun come up and go down, anywhere you see a nighttime, stars in heaven, moon in the skies, it tells us as a witness that there is a God in heaven. That's called general revelation. There is not a people on earth that does not understand that there is a divine being behind all this handiwork and firm in the sky. Day speaks to night and so forth. Every man, every continent, every generation has heard the voice, there is a God in heaven. Again, theologians call this general revelation, and though man needs the word of God, or what we call special revelation, in order to know who God is, or who Jesus is, uh, there, there is this revelation, this fear, this reverence that causes civilization everywhere to have some kind of religion. Now, it doesn't have to be, it's not Christianity necessarily, but nevertheless, they have some type of faith. I don't care what country it is. You and I that have the Word of God, we know who Jesus is. And what I'm saying today is creation and knowing that we have a Creator should be a roadblock to us to keep it from sinning. For instance, we know who the bridegroom is. We understand that He made the sun, just like the heat from the sun reaches every molecule on this earth. God has that same piercing ability to know all about us. Our Creator is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He knows everything we do. He knows everywhere we go. Uh, he knows everything we think. I want you to turn over to Psalm 139. Let me show you this in a personal way. Speaking of our Creator in Psalm 139, the psalmist David pins for us in a personal way just how intimately God knows us. He's our Creator. In Psalm 139, verse 1 says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. This is God's x-ray vision. Thou knowest my downsetting, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Before I, before I even really think it, as it begins to make its way into my brain, God knows what we're getting ready to think. Thou compassest me, my path, and my lying down, and art acquainted with my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. He hears everything we say. Thou hast beset me behind and before, laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Now he says here, where, where, where am I going to get away from you? He, he's going to find out just what Jonah found out when he ran from God. He said, whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy, thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall, shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the, the night shineth as the day, as far as in God's eyes. The darkness and the light are both alike, to thee, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. 
What that is saying is this, from your very conception until right now, God has known everything about you, and there's no way that you can get away from him, and there's no way that he cannot see your thoughts. Now, wait a minute. Did a Sunday school teacher try to teach you that when you were in kindergarten or first grade? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Does anybody remember that song? We try to teach our kids that there's no way you can get away from God because God is mighty and God's great and God's our creator. And I'm here to tell you adults and us that should know better that when it comes to this matter of sin, God sees it. And God didn't make you for that. God made your hands. God did not make your hands to sin. God made your eyes. He did not make your eyes to sin. God made your ears, and he did not make those ears to sin. He didn't make your hands to steal. He didn't make your eyes to lust. He didn't make your ears to be involved with filthy language and talk and so forth. I'm just saying that God made all of us. He made everything. Everything has a purpose. God made me. God made you, and we have a purpose, and God sees, and he knows when I sin, and that should stop me from sin. We can take this thing of God being the creator to the hilt. I understand that, uh, that God made grapes but God, uh, God, uh, d- 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 man, uh, sin that can see the fermenta- fermentation process. Uh, g- g- somebody said, what about pot marijuana? God made marijuana, but God, uh, sin that causes you to roll it and smoke it, I don't care if it is legal. Is everybody okay right now? You're going to live through that. I could go on and say this, that God, as our creator, he made the wheat, but it's sin that made the devil's brew, and God made the tree that made the paper for the magazine, but it's sin that made that magazine a dirty magazine, and God made the chip and the stone that's become silicone, but understand that when it's placed in a computer and used for filthy pornography, God had no part of that, and God made the saltpeter for gunpowder, but and he made the ore for the lead in the bullet and all of that, and for the steel for the gun, but it's sin that pulls the trigger. Ladies and gentlemen, understand, I'm talking about God as our creator. That ought to stop us sometimes. Y'all be able to walk out this morning and see the blue skies and the beautiful sunshine and the buds starting to come on the trees and say there is a God in heaven because there's a God in heaven. I'm going to face him someday. On and on and on I go and just say, I'm just saying that God puts up this great roadblock and stops us from sinning. You can go around if you want to, but you will pay a price. As the psalmist is meditating on this thing about sin, he says, first of all, he said, I, I, that's going to stop me. I mean, I, I, God's my creator. I'm going to face him. Secondly, write this down. The words of God's book should stop us. I'm just saying that God is the force that's trying to establish us and keep us from the evil way. God throws this first roadblock up. And you know what? Somewhere along the line, shouldn't we as creatures, God's creation, step back and say, yeah, I'm just going to live for God because of what he's done for me. Second roadblock he puts up is the Word of God. The words of God's book, verses 7 through 11, talks about that. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Again, we understand the importance of memorizing Scripture, and Scripture can pop up at the right time that will keep us from sinning. I'm just saying that God gives us His Word as a roadblock. Here the Bible says specifically in your Bible that His Word is perfect. It's the Bible that converts the soul of man. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit regenerates the believer, but it's the Bible that brings the man into conformity with Christ. Here the, in the text there in Psalm 19, it's the Word of God that it's sure, it's established, it can be trusted like a bridge over a vast raven, uh, ra- raven river. The Word of God is sure. The Bible says here the Word of God is right. You never have to question whether or not the commandments of the Bible are right. God is always right. God never makes a mistake. And your heart will rejoice when you decide to obey God and believe that God is right. The Word of God is pure. It's not contaminated. It's it's not to be messed with. The Word of God is true. All the Bible is true. Let God be true. Uh, And every man a liar, Romans chapter 3, verse 4. And there will be people who try to get you to believe that the Bible is not true. But understand, God's got that covered too. So keep that in mind. The Word of God is desirable, the Bible says here, more than fine gold and money. The Word of God is sweet, sweeter than honey. Uh, 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 And obeying the Bible carries with it a great reward. Just this morning, my wife cut open a hot biscuit. She put strawberry jam and butter on hers. I put butter and honey on mine. I love honey. I got in a little old bear plastic squeeze bottle. I could just... 
Nothing like honey. Say They say sugar's bad for you, and I think it's bad. But boy, honey, probably as bad as sugar. But the Bible describes that, that the word of God can be as sweet as honey if we obey it. In verse 11, and reading and obeying the Bible is a great roadblock to sin, but you can go around if you want to. You ought to hear the Bible speak <clears throat> when we're watching something on television that is wrong. We know it's wrong. You ought to hear the word of God speak, thou shalt not commit adultery. You ought to hear the words of God speak to flee fornication, and thou shalt not steal, and keep the Sabbath day holy, and honor your father and mother. I'm just saying that the Bible is a witness against our sin, and if we're born again Christian, the Holy Spirit of God will use the Bible on us every single time. So if you're involved in some type of particular sin, and the Holy Spirit brings the Word of God or the knowledge of the Scriptures up, you should use that to repent and get that right. See, preacher, I was always wondering why I feel that way. We call it conviction because it's a roadblock that God throws up. If you miss the first one, go around it. And you're just saying, I don't care if God created this right here. I'm going to abuse my body with it or whatever. Well, that's all right, but you're going to pay a price for it. So God throws up another thing for the Christian. He says, here's the word of God. Thus saith God. You can go around that if you want to, too. By the way, David went around that. I won't go into great discussion about that, but he blew it in his life. Thank the Lord that God came around and he repented of it and got it right, and we'll all be thankful for that. There's one more thing here, and that is this. The way to God through prayer, if you write that one down. Another roadblock he throws up is the way to God through prayer, verses 12 through 14. After recognizing God as his creator and the word of God as his warning device, David now goes to prayer. And he asks God for three specific things. I want to show you those here in just a moment. But when I say that the Word of God is God's warning device, I hope you never forget what I'm getting ready to say. That whenever you have committed some sin, and the Holy Spirit of God brings some Bible verse up to your inner man, I hope you hear that. I hope something goes off inside you that says, get it right. Get it right. Fix that. Slow down. You're driving 100 miles an hour. Back off. Get it right. Because what happens to a Christian is if they don't confess sin and get it right, it's easier to do the next time and easier the next time and easier the next time. And before long, you'll live such a life in that sin that you'll say, God, don't convict me about that. Everybody's doing that. Every Christian's doing that. And by the way, that's where America's at right now. Do you wonder why the New Testament church in this generation is beginning now to condone alcoholic beverage? I'm going to tell you why. Number one, Christians don't read their Bible, so they never developed any type of conviction about it either. Number two, preachers didn't preach on it. And some preachers even involved themselves in alcoholic drink. And now America is drinking itself drunk. And it's even inside the church house because nobody has any conviction about it. When I was a boy and growing up, by the way, any of you that's 50 years or older, you remember the preacher preaching on it. And it would scare you to death. And you knew, 50 years ago, you knew it was wrong. Can I get a little witness right there? But nobody cares anything about it anymore. And I'm just using that as an illustration. That when you hear that siren go off, by the way, where's the siren on that? Look not on the cup which moves itself of right that gives forth this color in the cup. The Bible's talking about fermented beverage right there. And the Bible says at last it biteth like a serpent and singeth like an adder. And I'm going to tell you what, you do it, you'll pay the price for it. That's okay. Is there a little social drink every now and then? I'm talking about a little social drink every now and then. Anyway, I don't know where that came from. just thought maybe... I remember R.G. Lee one time, the old preacher, was preaching years ago, and he was preaching on end times or something in prophecy, and, and all of a sudden he just kind of went off on liquor. He had that old accent, southern accent. He said, I hate liquor. Liquor's of the devil straight out of hell. I hate liquor. He just went off on it. After he's done, a couple of his men caught him at the back door, and he said, Dr. Lee, why did, you, why did you go off on liquor and alcohol right in the middle of your message on prophecy? He said, look back there. I saw a man licking his lips, looked like he wanted a shot of whiskey. I thought I'd let him know what God thought. Now, I didn't see any of y'all back there licking your lips, by the way. I, 
I'm just saying that every now and then you just got to sound the alarm. And, and I will tell you what, the next time you sit down inside the, the jet club over to the airport in some other city and you sit down and they put it out there because it's free, I hope you do, 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 do. I hope you just push away and say, give me a ginger ale. Give me a water with lemon. Get a water with lime and get an umbrella. I don't care what you put in there. I'm just saying, cherry on top. Don't drink. Amen. Okay, moving right along. Number three, so he's praying here, and, and he says, uh, I'm, I'm a sinner, and I, I just need you. Look what he says. He says, who can understand his errors? In other words, he said, I, I sin so much, I don't even know how bad I really am. Don't say amen right there. David said it. Cleanse me from the secret faults. Keep back that servant from presumption. What's he talking about? Number one, he says this. He prays three specific things. He says, cleanse me from secret faults. By the way, don't miss the simplicity of what I'm saying. God said, I want to establish you from the evil way. He said, I want to get you off the path of sin. I want you to get over here and I want to establish you in holy living. How does he do that? Number one, creation. Number two, the word of God or roadblocks. And number three, prayer. That's what I'm saying. In the uh, Lord's Prayer, we call it, which is actually the disciples' prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, uh, and uh, obviously I'm not Catholic. I don't pray this all the time, okay? <laughs> forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And what's the next phrase? And well, what are we praying that for? I have that one right because it's in my notes. Is my face red? It should be. Lead us not in temptation. Right there in the disciples' prayer, he's telling you to pray, God, keep me off that path. Keep me right with you. And David says, cleanse me from my secret faults, those faults and tendencies of sin that nobody else knows about you, but you and me, Lord. He's saying, Lord, you know my weak points better than I do. Help me not to fall into sin. Hebrews 12, 1 talks about the sin which does so easily beset us and that weight and so forth. He says, cleanse me from that. By the way, sitting right here in this auditorium, I'm talking about every one of us. You've got some secret faults, some secret sin. I want you to understand that God can help you win over that. He says, keep me back from presumptuous sins. That word presumptuous means arrogant. It's like saying, keep me back from myself. Keep me back from the pride of heart. David was a king, and often people in high places think that God gives him a little more license to sin uh, than he does others. Let me just say, that is a great fault. Don't ever think that. That is not true. God doesn't give any of us the license to sin. David said, keep me back from thoughts like this. He says, thirdly, he says, let my words and my thoughts be accepted in thy sight. He understood that what he thought, what he said with his mouth, came from on the inside. He says, Lord, just keep my thoughts focused on you and help me check my words before they leave my mouth. I want you to write down something I saw just this last week. Write this down. This will help you. It's a little prayer you can pray. Lord, in private, guard my thoughts. Lord, in private, help me guard my thoughts. Lord, in public, help me to guard my words. Write that down somewhere. Lord, in private, help me to guard my thoughts. And Lord, in public, help me to guard my words. What I'm saying is this. When you're all by yourself, especially for a long period of time, that's when Satan slips in and starts working on you. And that's where you need to pray. By the way, you're a setting duck when he does that. That's where you need to get the help of God who says, I'm going to establish you from the evil way. I want to get you right on the right path. That's where you need to pray, Lord, leave me not in temptation. Lord, help me do what's right. Guard your thoughts. Literally pray that prayer. I'm not talking about thinking about it. I say literally pray that prayer. And then when we're in public, uh, you ought to pray, help me to guard my words. In other words, don't throw everything out there that you're thinking. <laughs> uh, that's a great prayer right there. Praise God. Leave me not in temptation. It's a great roadblock. Now, let me close this thing down. There was a, uh, an old story about a man who tried to save a wicked city from destruction by warning the citizens. It's an old proverb, but the people ignored him, ignored his warnings. One day someone said, Oh man, why bother everyone? You can't change him. He said this, Maybe I can't. 
but I can still shout and scream to prevent them from changing me. Now, I'm going to tell you why I'm preaching this. I am watching America's culture change Christians. And if you don't build up some type of wall to fortify yourself with the help of God, you're going to be right on the dung heap of life with everybody else. It's sad. Lot was a righteous man who should have done some screaming in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he didn't scream. You say, how did he get out of there? Which is the point of my message. You can't keep yourself from sinning. God helps you keep from sinning. You can build up all the resistance you want to build up, but it's the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of us and the Word of God and the fact that God's our Creator and the fact that we try to work in tandem with God by praying and asking Him to help us. Yes, we're the ones that don't sin, but God's the one that helps us. How did Lot get out of Sodom? The Bible tells us, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, God delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy, filthy conversation of the wicked. The record of his life, Lot's life, reminds us of just how our sense of moral indignation can be dulled by the world. As Lot went into Sodom, because he liked it, likened it to the well-watered plains of Egypt, he said, I'm going to set my family here by the time the two angels came to get him, he was sitting at the gate with everybody else, all the other sinners. He didn't see anything wrong with it. You read his life, he chose to dwell there, involved in great witnesses. Genesis 13, when Sodom was invaded by hostile kings, he was captured. Even after Abraham rescued Lot, he was still drawn back to that wicked city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the last chapter of his story and his account is given in chapter 19 is full of heartache and shame as he tries to get out of there. And he can't even get his family to come with him. It's a sad thing. What a contrast with his righteous uncle Abraham, who recognized the roadblocks of sin, trusted God as his creator, obeyed God's word, lived morally, but it was his prayers to God for Lot that caused God to slip in there and drag him out. Now listen very carefully. If you're a born again Christian, you cannot lose your salvation. From the time that you're born again to the time that Jesus Christ comes back, you're going to live your life one of two ways. You're going to live your life in a worldly, sinful condition, or you'll live your life the best way you can on the victorious side, trying to live and obey God's word. There's something sitting here today say, say, saying, well, what's the matter? I'm going to go to heaven either way. Yeah, the Bible tells about some will be saved so as yet by fire, speaking about the fact that when Jesus Christ comes back, you'll be a skin of your teeth Christian. That's just great. Live your whole life, inherit heaven that Jesus died for, and do nothing for God. In fact, have to be judged for your life in heaven because you turned so many people away from Jesus Christ by your lifestyle. Or you can live the other way, the best way of your ability, best of your ability to live on the victory side, with a good testimony and trying to live above sin and higher ground. But the way we do that is we look to God as our creator and realize we're going to face him someday. And I guess one of the biggest deterrents in my life in this matter of sin is knowing that I, how am I going to face God and do that? And I'm not attempted with the big sins of alcohol and some of this other stuff. But as a preacher, I mean, I can get mad, get upset, get bitter about something. From time to time, my wife and I look at each other and we say, we, we can't feel that way. We've got to get our prayers answered. We've got people to reach. And how many times in the ministry you've got to get thick skin and just ask God to help you in your heart and move on? And I'm going to tell you something right now. Life is too short for us to realize that we don't have to stand before God someday. And then God gives us the word of God that literally names sin, pulls up in our lives the Holy, with the Holy Spirit of God that's supposed to stop us from sinning. And then the fact that we can get on our face before God and pray and say, oh, God, help me. 
Oh, God, I'm going to have to go here to this particular event. I need you to help me, Lord. I need you to help me here. Now God so graciously helps us do that. Years ago, I'll tell you this story, and I'm finished. Years ago, right after my wife and I were married, I had a tremendous, tremendous job opportunity. It was, it was an opportunity of a lifetime. And I felt like that this is something that I should do. My wife and I, we hadn't been married very long at all, and we prayed about it. In fact, we even went, I bought me some suitcases. I never had suitcases. You didn't travel anywhere in West Virginia. We had pokes. Y'all don't know what a poke is? How many know what a poke is? That's a brown grocery sack. We call that a West Virginia suitcase, all right? They don't make them anymore. It's plastic now. But we, we were so convinced this is what we were supposed to do. In fact, I even told the uh, people that I, I would take the job. And uh, I went to my first training session. When I went to that first training session, of course, I prayed before I got in there, and I went to that first training session. All these up, other people were, were at a higher level than me. I was just an intern. I was entry level going in. And we had our luncheon. We had our luncheon. Everybody drank alcoholic beverage. I was pretty much the only person there that got water. And they looked at me like a square peg in a round hole. I felt about that tall. I came home. I told my wife, I'm not doing that. And I walked away from that job opportunity. It's one of the best things I ever did in my life. I think that was a time in my life that God was testing me to see if I was willing to walk away from the money on the table and take a stand for the Lord. Now, since that happened, I've had, to, I've had to duplicate that particular scene, not in that way with maybe alcohol, but time and time and time and time again. And somewhere along the line, you're going to have to find a way to trust God and believe God wants to dig you out of a sinful life and get you off the evil way and get you on the right way. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Establish in holy living. Our Father, today we tried the best way that we knew how to take the Bible and show them a few ways. There are many, many more ways. But a few ways that you keep us on the right track. And I'm sure there are some today that have never thought about these. And maybe this will be a help to all of us who are prone to sin. And Father, maybe there's somebody here that's just the sin's got their clutches in them. And they need maybe more help. I pray that you'll let them understand how vulnerable they are. Maybe involve themselves in Reformers Unanimous here or, or just ask for some special help. But above all, Lord, if we're ever going to help other people, we've got to win over our sin. And teach us from thy word, we pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and no one looking around. I want to talk to Christians first, if I could, for just a moment. How many say this, preacher? I'm a born-again Christian. I understand that I'm a sinner saved by grace, and sin's going to follow me through life. But how many be honest and say, preacher, that helped me today? Would you lift your hand and put up real high? That helped me today. God bless you. If we're honest, many hands raised, many hands raised. So I'm going to ask you to use these things in your life. Maybe there's something, some condition that you just want to come pray about. Maybe you want somebody to pray with you today. We'd love to do that. Let me ask you just a couple other things. If you're here today and you're not sure that heaven's your home, can I tell you that Jesus Christ loves you with an everlasting love? He went to the cross to die for your sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no way you can ever have your sins forgiven without Jesus Christ have done, doing, done that for us. And today, you can have all your sins washed away if you'll just trust in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. He died there, but he didn't stay dead. He was buried three days, and the Bible says he rose again. The Bible says this, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And this day, today, you can come to Christ and be a born-again Christian. In just a moment, I'm going to pray for you. If you've never done that, we'd love to help you this morning. And then one more thing, if you've been saved, not been baptized, we want to help you. If you'd like to join our church, these men will help you. Father, this day I pray that you'll bless. And I suppose I can.